Hello and welcome to the Deutsche Welle session at the World Economic Forum on Africa. My name is Edith Kimani and we're coming to you from Kigali in Rwanda for the benefit of our global audience, also known as the land of 1,000 hills. Now, Africa's population is surging. In fact, UNICEF estimates that in the next 35 years, 1.8 billion babies are going to be born in Africa, essentially doubling the population and pushing the number of those under the age of 18 to 1 billion. Power demand will grow fourfold. And in order to meet this demand, countries will need to add 292 gigawatts of new capacity over the next 25 years. And so today we're asking, how can Africa leapfrog towards developing a smart energy system? To help me discuss those questions, I do have a very gender-balanced panel here. <laughs> and we'll begin to my extreme left with Mr. Erastus Mwencha. He's a deputy chairperson of the African Union. Um, and he's also a self-proclaimed pan-Africanist with 30 years experience in policy formulation and institutional transformation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Edith. Mm. On my extreme right, I'm joined by Jibril Adewale Kinubu. He is the group chief executive of Oando PLC. Um, it's Africa's largest integrated energy solution provider, at least according to your website. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And to the ladies now, on my left, I'm joined by Jacqueline Novogratz. She's a founder and chief executive officer of Acumen. Acumen, by the way, has invested 101 million in 92 companies. That's 101 million dollars. Um, and Jacqueline is also a best-selling author, and according to Forbes, she's one of the top 100 global thinkers. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. And finally, Jasandra Naika, who is a chief executive officer of Biotherm Energy, a renewable energy investment um, that is also an independent project with a development platform focused on sub-Saharan Africa. She also is a young global leader. Thank you for joining us, Jasandra. Thank you. We encourage you in our audience once more to participate online as well using the hashtag Future Energy. And so let me begin with the people on my right, Jasandra and Tinubu, because you're both players in the sector. And so Jasandra, based on your experience in the energy sector, what does the future of smart energy look like to you? Uh, I think the future of, um, excuse the pun, but the future of uh, smart energy is very bright. <laughs> Um, I, there's this great potential and opportunity on the African continent and uh, in terms of um, the question is how do we actually deploy the opportunity that has arisen. Uh, given the growth rates in Africa, given, given the fact that a large portion of this population will also migrate to cities over the next 20 years, um, there, there's an opportunity for both on and off grid uh, technology as, as well as uh, power facilities to come online. Okay. Um, Tinubu, Jasandra is saying that there's great potential, but we seem to always be talking about potential. Given your experience, do you think it's actionable? Um, <clears throat> I, I, th I don't think we have a choice. You know, <laughs> over 50% of the continent doesn't have access to energy of any sort. So we do need to take conventional sources um, uh, as, as, and add the, those to the renewable sources. And we do need to have a policy that seeks to drive uh, renewable energy to compensate for the shortfalls we have from other conventional sources like coal or, or gas or, or <clears throat> um, oil sources. And so following up on that, do you think that Africa will get to a point where we are relying solely on this smart energy solutions, green energy, completely getting rid of fossils? Well, I mean, I don't think we can completely get rid of fossils. If not, I'll be, I'll be out of a job and Rwanda will have no... <laughs> no commercial existence. But I think that we, we do have um, over 100 years of oil on the continent. We have over uh, 600 years of gas supply to power the whole continent and over 400 years of coal. Mm. So the question is, it's the energy mix that's important. Mm -hmm. And um, as we've known, Africa has been known to leapfrog technology um, and take the benefits of, 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 of global, uh, global um, evolution. Um, and I see us being able to take that opportunity in the past sector by using um, a lot of the, the benefit of, 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 in, of uh, innovation, global innovation. For example, in Abu Dhabi, um, solar power, they've been able to get it down to four cents per kilowatt hour, 
which is under the price today of conventional power sources. Right. We'll get into pricing later, but you did mention technology and how Africa has been able to leapfrog in that sector. But it's also being used together with energy. We have M-Pesa, m, -Pesa, m being used to bring access to renewable power to people in Africa. Jacqueline, you do know quite a bit about this, don't you? Yeah, um, Acumen um, has been investing in off-grid solar companies for the last 10 years and has invested in about over 20 of those companies, really taking it from 2006 when we first invested in D-Lite, which had a single solar torch, and as you were saying, um, the price was $4 a watt at that time. Over the last 10 years, we've seen three major shifts in technology that aren't just in the solar space, but in the cell phone space, as you said, Edith. On the solar space, you've seen the price come down by more than 80%. You've seen batteries prolonging their lives. The, um, the cell phone revolution actually has two components to it. On the one hand, because almost every African now owns a phone, and we're seeing people move so quickly into s smartphones, as an off-grid provider, you can have a direct relationship with every one of your customers, with your sales force, and you can use your phones to meter and to monitor. That connects to the second thing that you mentioned, which is when MCOPA came on in 2011, which from my perspective was the beginning of the, the off-grid solar revolution at household and mini-grid level, mm -hmm. is that now people could pay for the, their, their home systems in the same way that they could pay for kerosene on a daily basis. And if they stopped paying, the companies could turn off their units. So the credit risk has dropped dramatically. So you have those three components working together. And we've seen, in the case of D-Light, 30% um, of all Kenyan rural households now own one of those products. There's a 70% brand recognition. And Copa has already reached a million people. Mm -hmm. D-Light globally has reached 60 million. We can accelerate these numbers off-grid as part of that mix in a way that's faster, less expensive, and more effective for the rural population in ways that sometimes will connect to the grid and in other cases will be a destination in and of itself. Doesn't even need to be a bridge. And that is thrilling. And as you were saying, that's where Africa can really be a leader in the world. Um, and as an American, I feel jealous seeing it. <laughs> so, Mwencha, having worked with so many African countries, do you think that governments are creating policies that will enable such penetration and access to happen? Yes. Um, well, it's not acceptable this day and age that in Africa you have over 600 million people without access to energy. That means for Africa, you are looking at every, for every three people, two don't have access. It's actually a scandal because in some cases, like the case of my brother from Nigeria, producing petroleum but importing consumption again. So there are now many initiatives in the continent which start from, of course, even under what we call the NEPAD programs. We have developed programs which have got to do with policy, uh, but also uh, encouraging partnership with the private sector because the figures we are mentioning, if you look at in terms of investment, we require almost $1 trillion to access for people to access that energy. Yeah. And so one must then develop a strategy of how to mobilize those resources okay. for the people to access that energy. So, and so, Jasandra, you obviously know the importance of the partnership between government and the private sector. And in South Africa, this has worked really well. Could you please tell us more about that? Uh, sure. Um, so, South Africa has a renewable energy independent power producer program. Uh, it kicked off in um, uh, July of 2011. And um, as of yesterday, there were 2.3 gigawatts of installed renewable energy on the grid. So in a very short period of time, um, so roughly five years, uh, and let me just say that the first set of projects that were awarded uh, actually only started construction in November of 2012. So in, in a space of three and a half years, we've managed to bring 2.3 gigawatts of additional clean energy to the grid. Uh, and that has been a uh, partnership, to use your word, uh, between government and, and independent power producers. And this is where the private sector has really shown ensuring that these projects come online on time, 
Most of them have overperformed what was expected. Um, we've helped in, in terms of improving infrastructure. And in addition to that, uh, most of the uh, independent power producers have also deployed a uh, local community program. So in addition to producing power, uh, a sliver of revenues is being used towards uh, economic development, enterprise development, and socioeconomic initiatives that serve the community in which they operate. Okay, so the benefits are pretty clear. So Mwensha, why is there such a big difference between the countries who are investing and doing really well, such as South Africa, and the ones who aren't? Well, of course policies at national level uh, don't necessarily move in tandem for the whole continent. There are evaluations, there, there are some differences. But I think if you look at the mobilization that is now taking place and the awareness, uh, there is that general search forward. And, and you can see, for instance, a number of programs which are underway uh, in terms of grid connections. In other words, even under regional cooperation, there is that very you know, concerted effort to do that. You see, for instance, what ADB is trying to do and extending this facility to many countries to access. Uh, soft loans. Uh, ADP, as a matter of fact, is putting out something like 12.5 billion, which you want to leverage mm -hmm. with the private sector and other international partners so that we can meet this. You have seen initiative, for instance, under US or you know, Obama initiative, uh, there is UK, there is, and in fact, even on our part, some of the energies like uh, geothermal, which is very much extensive, we are inviting private sector. We, are, we have even made a provision for uh, risk because sometimes if you drill and you don't hit a steam, it's capital that is costly for those who venture. So we are even covering those risks. So there are uh, lots of initiatives. Okay. Because mind you, if, if we are talking of transformation, because what uh, my brother mentioned, uh, you know, this low energy, I mean, uh, export prices now we are facing, the answer is transformation is diversification mm. and we can't diversify without energy. Okay. We can't educate without energy. I'm hearing Jasandra saying hmm, but Wale, do you agree with this? Do you think the private sector is being left to carry the burden of this transformation or are governments, as Wencha is saying, really involved? Well, I'm, I'm an avowed capitalist <laughs> uh, so I do believe that the governments should do what they do best, which is create an enabling environment mm -hmm. and the private sector should be spurred growth in the continent. And I think it's particularly important in Africa because we're dealing with limited sources of capital and we're dealing with great explosive demand, particularly from population and also from industrialization, from, um, from, from, from people going from poverty into the middle class. So there's a big demand for goods and services. Um, in Nigeria, we suffered by subsidizing power. And what happened was with the, with the consistent demand pools, this 3% growth in population on an annualized basis, we went from a $30 billion economy 20 years ago to a $550 billion economy last year. And we ended up producing 50% of our electricity via private diesel generators owned by homes mm -hmm. at approximately 20 cents per kilowatt hour when we could have had industrial power generated at 4 cents or 5 cents. Um, and what was missing was having an enabling environment, which the government has finally realized and has privatized the power system, liberalized tariffs, and in the process we're now seeing the private sector getting involved in building new power plants and we're now attracting global capital. Right. So the difference is that we, power is now seen as a business opportunity for investors to make a return, whilst it's seen, and it's effectively a social um, a palliative because people now have access to cheaper power Okay. Than, than when the government was subsidizing and unable to meet that demand. Okay, so let's go to Jacqueline because you did mention the social aspect of this. We do know that energy is definitely a key driver of the economy, but the social benefits are tremendous, especially when people go off the grid. Absolutely, and I, well, I just want to pick up a little too on what Wally was saying because if you look at the leadership, and it's connected to, to what you were saying as well, the leadership is stepping up in a different way, recognizing the social and the economic benefit. And so um, President Kagame has a 22% off-grid goal for Rwanda as part of the overall energy. Um, that's partially understanding that if you are talking about energy, you are talking about the opposite of poverty in many ways. Mm -hmm. And so the social benefits are 
imagining rural households, two-thirds of Africa, that um, can start to see their rooftops as mini power stations, mm -hmm. that you move immediately from darkness literally into light, that we see um, health benefits overnight, 36% of all respiratory is connected to kerosene. Uh, it's very expensive, and so now people are earning more income, there's more productivity, jobs are created. Um, I've already talked about health, the, the environment, needless to say. So from an investment perspective, if we start to think about our returns, financially, they're there in the off-grid space. And we've got to get more smart investment capital into that space, a different kind of lending as well to enable these companies to grow. But for the customers, they see their own economic benefit and the social benefits are immense. So there is no better investment, and I think that President Adesina at African Development understands that. We're starting to see African presidents really take this on. But as someone who's really focused on patient capital and believes in it um, at Acumen, this is really going to take all of us, um, government, the, the private sector, and civil society working together to create that smart um, system off-grid and on-grid. Okay, so Moncha, let me come back to you on that while we're still talking about these partnerships between public and private. Um, would you say that there is a political and perhaps even legal interference and more specifically the issue of corruption when it comes to implementing um, energy projects? Well, I think, of course, you cannot deny that there is no uh, corruption, um, but that you must create structures that minimize or eliminate corruption. One of them, of course, as uh, my brother said earlier on, you must segregate, for instance, government cannot be a producer, a regulator, and a player at the same time. Mm -hmm. So if you separate some of those, you minimize. And of course, there are now schemes, for instance, in terms of procurement to make sure that you develop them in such a way that y you have systems that are accountable and also transparent. So that is indeed an issue. And just speaking on what uh, she was talking about earlier on, on uh, government policy, you saw leaders seated here yesterday, all committed, and you have seen that leadership. And so some of the areas that we need to pursue, for instance, incentives, for instance, elimination of tariffs on solar panels so that you can encourage off-grid uh, so that people then can access. Yes, yes, there are schemes to try and tackle those issues, but also expand access. Okay, Jasandra, I know you did say that the incentives to invest in energy seem to be skewed, they seem to be wrong. What should the incentives be based on what Wencha said? Um, I, I agree with Wencha in terms of you know, government needs to separate its roles. Um, the incentives are really a, a good regulatory environment, a willingness to realize that this is a sense of urgency, and in order to implement and roll out uh, new or smart energy, there needs to be a time frame in place. So, uh, you know, we see some, especially in West Africa, a fair number of the, the, the governments and regulatory authorities who are very keen to make sure that they accelerate the rollout. Um, in, in Burkina Faso, for example, the intention is that these projects start construction no later than January of next year, and you, you need to be operating in, in, in the same year. And I think that's great. The sense of urgency that's coming through is important, but it's not everywhere. It's, it's happening only in some countries. A, a fantastic example, actually, was Uganda's Gedford program, where together with the DFI, the Ugandan government decided to roll out a renewable energy program. There were small projects. There were five megawatts each. Um, it was a tender-based program. Um, there was a, a part subsidy provided by a DFI. Um, there was a bankable PPA in place. And the projects got built. They're currently in construction, and, and I think one or two are actually going to start operating now. And, and that's speed to market. You know, not, not every country in Africa has a huge energy need from a grid-connected perspective. And therefore, when you look at how to deploy these projects, you should look at what, firstly, the grid can hold, but also the other opportunity in terms of, well, what could we do at an off-grid, at a rural basis, rather than bringing everybody into the cities. Right. Um, and so do you think um, that while it, that policy uncertainty, if that could be corrected, then what Jasandra is talking about could be accelerated. Yeah, I definitely think so. Um, because what we're trying to do is, is attract capital, 
um, not just from international sources, but also from within our local environment. And the only way you can do that is by having structured policies which reward those who invest in power sources that are sustainable. Um, I would like to see where, if, if there's a choice to subsidize, and subsidize, subsidies should be driven towards renewable sources, which can be done off-grid in a decentralized manner to help people in rural communities access to electricity or, or, or power in general. And we do need to focus really on ensuring there's more regional cooperation, because we've got countries that have excess power, which, which need to be able to export to countries that don't have, don't have power on the structured side. You have countries that have the benefit of, 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 of having massive um, um, hydro projects, okay, which can be done on a regional basis. We haven't seen enough regional projects which we could encourage on a, on a large scale. And as I said earlier, it's really about the energy mix, doing conventional renewables, and um, most of all, using it as a means of economic empowerment for poorer people. And somebody mentioned the issue of, of solar panels on homes, for example, and, and providing that support from a policy perspective um, from, from, uh, from, from small loans like the SMEs. 50% of the SMEs in Nigeria um, generate their own power privately using diesel generators. It's very, very expensive mm -hmm. to contribute into, into, into a society, but yet they're profitable because the demand for their goods and services are very, very strong. And that's really, really the largest or the fastest means of creating, of reducing un un unemployment. It's actually coming from the SMEs within our own environment. Okay, so Jacqueline Wale is talking about something which you had touched on earlier. The idea of mini-grids or home solutions, decentralizing this idea of energy, but how do we scale that so that it's something that's replicated across the continent? Well, thanks for asking that, and it's connected directly to what you were saying, Wale, in that when you think about the, the first 20 com companies in which we invested, all of that investment capital was backed by philanthropic money that allowed us to take the kind of financial risk that nobody else wanted to take. We were the first in at D-Light. We were in the, among the first investors with MCOPA, with SolarNow, with Devergy, mini grids, as well as home systems and product companies. It took almost 10 years to get to a place where these companies now are poised for growth. They need significant capital, impact capital, and this is where government and DFIs can really make an enormous difference. And so I would think not only about an enabling environment, but an, an accelerating environment. When you think about the challenges to growth, there are really three. And the first one is the, we have to change the whole narrative. One, what we're talking about, that power is power on grid and off grid, because too many rural communities are waiting for the grid to come to them. Politicians are, are promising it to them. And so the home system and mini grid companies don't have the advantage of helping people understand that it is in their economic benefit to purchase one of these home systems. Okay, and so how can we change that mindset? I know you have a second point, but just touch on that. So, I think governments first and foremost can change that mindset, and I know that in Rwanda there's a whole conversation about an awareness campaign. Those awareness can ca campaigns can come from government and the NGO sector and the companies themselves. But so we need real marketing dollars the companies are too small to be spending all of their money on that now. They need support. Second is the, the financing on three levels. The, the equity investing, um, we are now looking at really accelerating our own investing in this area, specifically with East Africa. And so bringing in other investors that are looking at much more fo uh, a longer term but growth capital into those companies. They can be supported with DFI support guarantees and the DFIs coming in to support them. The, 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 the working capital piece is a huge need for companies to finance their own growth. And so banks have got to change the narrative as well mm -hmm. and see these companies as viable in the off-grid space, not only in the on-grid space. And finally, consumer financing, where I think that mobile banking and Kenya has really taken the lead on this, will continue to be the leader, but we need to change a narrative, Edith, around who the consumers are. Because if you look at a Mobisol or, a, um, or an MCOPA, their default rates at the poorest consumer level are four to six percent. So 
we shouldn't be withholding capital, we should be accelerating it mm -hmm. and looking at new ways of doing that with government support, government guarantees, bonds that can be built to really accelerate the growth of these, these companies. So Mancha, why do you think capital is being held? I, I think it's been mentioned early on by Wade that policy can frustrate. Mm. Uh, I believe very strongly that there is a lot of capital out there waiting and ready to come into the energy sector. But if, for instance, you have tariffs which do not reflect the cost mm -hmm. of production, you discourage that. So there is need. But then you must also then address the issues you mentioned, uh, structure, the energy sector, that policies around it, you know, that you can have distribution company, generation company, uh, not all doing the same thing so that you can encourage off-grid. I think that is really part of the reforms that we need to encourage capital flow into energy. Okay, we have a question off of Twitter. It's by I Chaffa, and touching on the issue of technology, I think, Sandra, I'd like you to take this. More technology could disrupt the job market and create larger inequalities in Africa. How do we avoid that? I suppose it's technology specifically, a lot of technology too quickly in one sector. Um, I don't see how more technology is going to make it more jobs or uh, create more greater disparity. I actually think if we look at what technology has done over the last 10 to 20 years, it's been disruptive, but it's actually allowed for greater dissemination to a large, much larger population than ever before. And I, I like to use the mobile phone in, in Africa as, as a fantastic example. You know, when it first started, it was a few and far between, but when, really, when it started becoming cheap, everyone has it. And I think I've been told that, the, you know, that in some countries in Africa, the, the average person has two or three phones, depending on which cell phone coverage he, he needs at a particular point in time. So it's become a, a point of time where the more technology we've had, the greater competition, the cost of production has come down significantly. And, and, and we're also seeing that in the solar sector. I mean, the cost of production is, is significantly low. And to your point, uh, more recently, Dubai announced that their solar program has resulted in a price of 2.9 cents, 99 cents per kilowatt hour. And that's fantastic. I mean, you know, we're really seeing the impact of technology, and it's allowing for greater access to more people. So. Yeah. Um, so greater technology, in your opinion, definitely a good thing. Yes. But I want to look at the barriers in specific sectors. Um, and while it just out of curiosity, what do you think is a key barrier when it comes to achieving the potential for hydropower, for example? Or more specifically, I think, solar for you. Um, barriers to entry. I, I think we've said it several times, and I think the key is government policy. Um, we do need uh, cost-reflective tariffs as a priority. Mm -hmm. We need transparency in the opportunities. Um, we need speed in terms of decision making. Mm -hmm. And we need the capacity to merge sources of public funding with private sector funding. And I say that because certain projects will not be bankable on day one. And that's where you need the government to step in with, say, 20%, for example, mm -hmm. on the hydro project. Okay, and then you have the you know, DFIs can come in for, for maybe 30, 40%, and then commercial credit or debt could do the rest. Um, the challenge you have is that in order to make energy projects um, bankable, you need to, um, you have a long term um, period where there's a, 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 long, a gestation where, there's, where, the, where the economics doesn't make sense, first couple of years in particular. Um, because at the end of the day, as people key on to the system, it becomes cheaper and cheaper, and there's a marginal reduction in the cost. So this is where the public-private sector, uh, uh, public-private sector projects really make the difference. And of course, classic examples: you're not going to have a straightforward hydro project without elements of the public sector, because there's water. You're dealing with rural areas. You're dealing with flooding. You're dealing with, in, in certain instances, deforestation when you launch a hydro project. Okay? And you need the private sector capital because, at the end of the day, uh, most governments are strapped with the with the inability to provide uh, appropriate funding across the board for health, uh, education, and all the, all, the, all the other things. But I think Africa is one of those continents where um, the only way we can truly develop okay, is to make ourselves um, um, the true bride for, for global private sector investment. Um, because the demand exists okay, for, the, for, 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 the, for the product. We are, we are potentially the largest power market in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a... Um, 
it's ridiculous when you compare our statistics in terms of what we consume to what countries like, for example, Vietnam consumes four times more electricity than Nigeria does, yet Nigeria is five times more in terms of population, or even twice as much in terms of GDP. So there's a misplaced priorities in terms of the way and manner in which, we, which, we, which, which the economies um, are developing, and we're, we're losing a, a, glow, a wonderful opportunity to leapfrog um, out of poverty by not having a more uh, sustainable or, or robust energy policy. Okay. Uh, except you've somehow managed to encourage investment despite the lack of clear policies. Well, it's, it's one reason that I think that you're seeing much of the innovation um, happening in Kenya and Rwanda um, and South Africa. It's so interesting listening to you, Jasandra, because the tariffs in Kenya and Rwanda are, are very good now for entrepreneurs working in the solar area. And so I think that the opportunity is to get better government policy um, and to, again, move into the, finan the financing part because it's time to really accelerate the financing into these companies and to recognize that the kind of financing that's needed needs to understand that we're still at an innovation moment, that we don't have all of the answers yet in the world to what it will take to fully accelerate, particularly at the mini-grid level. But at the home system level, we have a lot of the technologies. Now we need to scale them. And if you think about the fact that it takes most governments about $1,000 to connect a, house, a rural household to the grid, and it will take a number of years to extend that grid. On the other hand, the uh, uh, a 510 watt system, most of um, MCOPA systems are 8, eight, eight watts, D lights are between 5 and 10. If you at that starter level, it's more like $150 um, that can be financed by the household itself mm -hmm. over a one to two year period. You fully change the economics of what it will take to reach the rural poor. And so we still need to do more work in financing the early stage on mini grids where I think there is a lot more question but we're seeing really accelerating innovation but on the home system market this is something that is ready for business and so it's really a, a case of getting the capital flowing in in the right ways and ensuring that the the runway continues to be cleared at, at an ever increasing pace by government. Okay, although we do have some very unique challenges in Africa sometimes. So in Kenya, for example, there's an investor who's available, but problems of land and the community around it um, then stall these projects. And I know you're shaking your head because it's obviously quite sad, but Mwensha, apart from, you know, as we wait for policy implementation, what are some of the things that even people at community level can do? I think that's a real problem, uh, particularly if we're going to talk of projects like solar. At the moment, the technology we have, you occupy a huge space to be able to produce a megawatt. And so there is need for those innovate, I mean, entrepreneurs entering that sector also to be aware of how you manage local communities. Mm -hmm. Part of it, of course, then it might be if you're producing this energy, serve the community immediately or involve them in the project, give them some equity, so that you can solve the problem of land, because uh, that, that is a, 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 a situation that you also need to integrate the rural communities so that they can have benefit. But also the point you mentioned, then is, uh, and I agree, I mean, if you look at the issue of energy today, we can't transform without energy. Today, it accounts for almost 2% lack of our GDP. And if you added that, then you could be transforming the continent. The cost is too high for us to sit back. And the time is not with us because for a young continent, we need people to go to school. If you are going to have school, people accept computer. People access good education. You must change the mindset. And so Africa is not sitting with the time that is on its side. So issues like speedy approvals so that you can encourage investment, so, but things are changing. I mean, you can see, and she mentioned some of the leaders, some of the countries that are now setting the pace, and it's a matter of time before we see this great movement. Yeah, sure. And, and, and I think it's, it's easy to underestimate the power of the rural African yes. consumer. And that is one of the reasons that I'm so excited after 10 years of investing in this space 
at the economical, uh, economic potential and the social potential that can be unleashed. So with cell phones, we're now able to um, get very quick feedback from the customers of all of these different systems. And these are people who make very little money. And what we're learning as the field is learning is that there really is something called an energy ladder, where when low-income people make the decision to get just three light bulbs and a radio and a cell phone charger, it is sometimes within months that they decide to upgrade their system and bring on televisions and refrigerators and um, hair cutting so that they can move into economic development. And I have met so many um, rural women who will go out of their way to sell systems to their neighbors so that they can make things move. Mm -hmm. uh, the issue is that the companies don't have the working capital to move inventory fast enough to meet consumer demand. Mm -hmm. That's why we've got to really accelerate that. But right. if we really are looking at speed, we should start with who the customer is and recognize that there's a real mix that's, that's needed as we industrialize mm -hmm. and as we light the continent. And as we're speaking about speed, obviously one of the ways to do that, accelerating this process, is regional integration. And I know that in Southern Africa that's definitely happening, Zambia and Zimbabwe are working together. Uh, but why aren't we seeing a lot more of this across the continent? Okay. So um, when people talk to me about regional integration, the first thing that comes uh, to mind for me is the the well-known Grand Inga project, uh, which is 30 years into development and still has not happened. And I think there's a lot of complexity when we look at regional integration, and um, especially when it comes to a grid-connected project, okay? There's grid ownership on different sides of the country, you know, who's gonna take, uh, wield the power, what's the cost associated, there's two different policies from two different, and it gets very complicated, yeah. and I think, First and foremost, if we really want to solve the energy crisis in Africa, we need to look into our countries first, first and foremost, before we think get big. I mean, I think the Grand Inga project is, is, is very ambitious, but I don't think we should be setting our hearts and hopes in terms of that being our solution to our power needs, because it's not going to happen in the next two or three years. We, sense of urgency, when I talk sense of urgency, I see it needing to happen in the next two to three years. That is a sense is of that, urgency. Is that realistic though, based on all the challenges we're well, talking about? I'm, I'm gonna give you my example. In my company, we, from site identification to actually bringing a project online, which means operating, providing power to the grid, it took us 36 months, and we did that twice. So if, if a small company in, in um, uh, like mine can, can do that, I think more and more players out there that can actually do it. And it, for us, it was first and foremost, to your point about land, we made sure, first and foremost, that we, the, the people, the community in which we operated really understood what we were doing, how we were going to do it, and when it was going to come online, and when benefit was going to accrue to them. And we managed expectations from day one, and that is what is important. Don't sell a dream that's never going to be realized. Sell something that you think is going to be realistic. In fact, even be prudent about it. And if you over, uh, if you over deliver on it, fantastic. And I think that's what will help in terms of ensuring things do move faster. We looked at bankability from day one. And I'm not, not talking South African projects here. We, look, we looked at bankability from day one. How do we actually get both the debt side of the equation and the equity side of the equation comfortable in terms of, of, of developing this project. And we looked at all our risks and we said, okay, these are the plans in terms of how we mitigate it. And I think the, the more we look at that approach, I mean, we're not building huge projects. We're not looking at gigawatt size projects. You know, We're saying, well, this is the grid. This is what it can do. Let's build something around this. Mm -hmm. And we are producing power. And I think that's what's important. I mean, I, I do have great expectations that I should be putting up half a gigawatt every year, but I'm not looking at that. I'm saying, well, in some countries, you know, even if I add an additional 10, 10 megawatts or 20 megawatts to the grid, I'm really enhancing and creating value. And I'd rather do that sooner than later. Mm. All right. It did. It did. Just the question that you asked about not seeing many regional initiatives. At continental and uh, regional level, we now have power pools being developed. Uh, Southern African Power Pool that has been mentioned, East African Power Pool. As a matter of fact, to give you an example, Rwanda is now looking at the possibility of importing energy from Ethiopia. Ethiopia is already supplying part of northern Kenya, and there is a scheme to run that line 
much further. And of course, the thing I mentioned, if you go to West Africa, there is, of course, a gas pipeline that is being developed. And so there are regional initiatives, uh, but of course, we need to see more of these. We need and, to see more. Uh, exactly. Okay, I'd just like to open the conversation up to the audience. If we have any questions, we'll start taking them now. We have a question here. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sridhar. I'm director of projects from a group called the Export Trading Group. We are majority into agriculture commodities. The topics which you discussed was very relevant, but I was a little concerned, but for Mr. Thinubu, we did look at as a comprehensive problems. What we see is this. Hydropower is the cheapest power and the cleanest power we all know. Africa generates just 7.5% of the total from hydro. Globally, approximately 17%. But China is very high in high, a composition of hydropower. And that speaks in its development and the agricultural growth. We see only power. And I was very happy to see in this World Economic Forum, in which two main topics was power and agriculture. But we fail to think them together. Africa is ridden with flooding, drought, poverty, food importation, shortage of power. One simple solution, hydro, hydro power, can solve all the... Why not we talk a concentrated effort, speaking on it, and I was very much appreciate looking at the hashtag we put, smart energy. We should look at energy first, then smart. One should have a baby, then before thinking of naming it. <laughs> okay, uh, so I don't know if Mwantra, you want to address this. Yes, um, it's true that Africa is only exploiting about 70% of hydropower potential. But if you look at in terms of distribution of the major, uh, call it waterways, uh, they are not very much evenly distributed. But we are also now experiencing some challenges because if you look at some of the projects like uh, the case of Zambezi, with climate change, you can see now dams uh, you know, uh, so there is need for us to diversify. Mm. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. So that you have a good energy mix. Uh, for instance, in the case of we have coal, we have sun, we have, uh, you know, gas, we have geothermal. So I think the answer is to have energy mix. And the question is, what policy are you pursuing? Because if you are doing for industrialization, yes, those big base lines, it's important to use them. But if you are trying to solve, solve, solve the problem of energy access, you have to think of solar and the rest. So yes, you cannot pursue one line at the exclusion of others. And okay. I think this is the approach that the continent is taking. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions from uh, the audience? Yes? And then we'll come to you. Sure. Yeah, hi, my name is Peter. I'm uh, with the Swedish newspaper, Svenska Dagbladet. Um, I was wondering, I've uh, talked to a Swedish uh, CEO of an energy company who uh, uh, showed me some statistics about the potential in solar power. And in his regard, the potential of solar power decides where the future of manufacturing will be. And basically what his, he said was that, well, the majority of the potential is in Africa. So how big do you think the potential is when it comes to solar power? Can it actually also make uh, Africa become the new uh, hub of manufacturing, or the home of industrial manufacturing? Jasandra, I think I'd like you to take that, given that you deal with solar. Okay, great. Uh, well, very good question. Um, the potential of solar on the African continent is huge. Uh, no doubt about that. And uh, it's, uh, I, I smiled when you, when you asked the question about local manufacturing, because Within the South African program, local content is a key aspect in terms of you actually being competitive in, 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 your, in the auction. Um, however, uh, we need to look at what we want to do from a manufacturing perspective. If the intention is job creation, how do we actually do that? And what is our supply side in terms of skill sets looking like relative to the jobs that we need to create? So I do think over time it could become a great manufacturing hub. Uh, and a fully vertically integrated manufacturing hub. But for now, I do think that there is opportunity if companies, manufacturers, can actually see a longer term horizon in terms of projects being deployed across the African continent, be it off-grid or on-grid for that matter, and that there is pipeline. 
and that their, the ability for them to invest that capital that is required to set up that manufacturing facility can actually pay back, I do think that there'll be more and more interest in terms of setting up manufacturing facilities on the African continent. All right, um, the lady at the front. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joyce Ann Wainaina, and I think this particular conversation is very interesting uh, for various reasons. I mean, this is really the story about Africa. I I'd like to first go back to the very first point that I believe Wale made. Uh, Africa has about 100 years of oil, 400 years of something else, and, and it kind of links to your question. How many years of solar do we have on the continent? I would say that's about a billion. Or more and that is really where the yes. potential is and solar combined with Africa's new disruptive force which is mobile I have visited MCOPA and to me that is the true um, disruptor but what I do agree though is that we do need a combination of everything because solar mobile is uh, almost a, a domestic solution but for real industry we do need the coal we do need the, the oil etc mm -hmm. But we have to think about how it affects us from a clean energy solution perspective. The, the, the challenge or the question that I have is, you know, we keep looking at how do we make this continent wide? We look at non-trade barriers, non-tariff barriers, almost always thinking about it in terms of goods, but we don't think about it in terms of service. How do we export the idea of solar mixed with mobile across Africa? How, how do we get this done? Okay, Wally, I think, yeah, I think the, ch the challenge really with our continent and, and planning for our future is really that we don't really um, plan, put it that way. Um, we have a, a myriad sources of energy which we could tap, and um, the question is what comes first? What's our short term plan, a medium term plan, and a long term plan? What's available? And how do we get these different sources of energy? into a national policy or a continent-wide policy and get it implemented over time, no different from how we've taken positions on corruption or taking positions on, on regional integration like we've done with SADC and ECOWAS and, um, and um, uh, COMISA and effectively create an energy policy for the continent because I think it's really, without a doubt, the biggest, um, uh, the biggest challenge we have to economic growth is really our poor consumption of energy and, and our, our, very, our very expensive consumption of energy. We're never going to become an, become an exporting continent until we lower our cost of energy and we, we take advantage of these different sources. 50% of our population right now is, 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 is no longer in rural areas, it's now in the urban areas. Mm -hmm. You're not going to find many solar, solar solutions working in the urban areas um, in the short term. In the, in the short term, you need conventional power, and that's where electricity will come in. It's going to be either, um, somebody said, either going to be via you know, oil, which is one of the biggest sources, okay, gas, or, um, or, 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 um, um, or um, uh, hydro, for example, in the short term. And in the medium term, we can start to take the benefits of other solutions, for example, the remote solutions which we could deal with in terms of the rural areas. There's so much investment that's already gone into creating grids, okay? And those grids are very inefficient, okay? The systems are gone. I mean, we were able in Nigeria to build a, a 150-kilometer gas pipeline over the last 10 years to take away 80% of the industrial capacity in Lagos State, take, moving them off um, conventional sources of, of uh, energy onto a, a gas pipeline and reducing their, their power demand by 60%. Now, this was a, a private sector initiative done as a, as a concession from the government where we approached the government and said, look, you know, you've got this gas, you don't do anything with this gas, mm -hmm. okay? We need to, we will, we will take project risk, we'll build out a pipeline, we'll sign off customers, and we're able to go around customers, okay? And we built the pipeline in, 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 in five phases, 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers, 40 kilometers, and signed up customers and made each section bankable as we went along. Okay. So the point I'm making is that we're going, we're, we start with, first of all, planning, put, put everything, all, put the mix together in terms of all the different sources, uh, uh, take into account our demand pools, our population growth, for example, 
taking things that can't afford the bill. because a lot of countries can't afford these things. So we can speak all we want about hydro projects, but a hydro project is a huge capital endeavor yeah. which many countries cannot afford. Mm -hmm. Okay, the only way they're going to afford it is by a combination of all the different pools of capital and demand coming together to create a bankable project. And until then, we're going to need to focus on on an African solution for an African problem. Okay, fantastic that you say that because I'm really curious, Mwencha, whether when the AU comes back to sit here in Kigali a few months from now, if this is one of the things they'll be talking about, a continental policy on renewable energy. We already have that uh, framework. In fact, we have a sectoral uh, setting where ministers of energy from Africa meet, power pools meet, and all you know, uh, stakeholders to develop policy. And, and even, as you said, we have also developed uh, short-term, medium-term action plans based on available technology, uh, capital outlays, and the rest, so that we can roll out. And, and as we roll out this project, I mean, we are also even thinking of, Africa must start thinking of, how do we have the capacity for nuclear? Mm. But of course, that, and for peaceful purposes. So it's not just pursuing one track at, uh, you know, all the time. But we are looking at all options and, and making all this in terms of what we can do today uh, and investment all in right. that line. I know in our poll question we asked whether people think Africa will be fully electrified by a certain period of time. But let's take this further. Do you think Africa will ever be a net exporter of power? Africa is already a net exporter of power. I mean, if you look at it, how would you define that? <laughs> if you look at it in terms of... Uh, uh, we are exporting, uh, you know, crude oil and the rest, which is used outside. We have coal. But yes, in fact, if you look at, for instance, the Inga project, which is now gaining momentum, that project can light Africa and Europe. So uh, if, if we get capital, of course, it's a huge capital outlay. We can. And I think a day is coming that Africa can be able to do that. Okay. Jacqueline. Well, I, I want to go back to the, the, the other question quickly because um, I actually would not bet against solar getting to the place, point where it will have industrial capacity. And so I think that it's a myth that it's the grid for, the, for industry only and off-grid that we were talking about this before. We're starting to see mini grids get to a point where they will be able to provide this kind of in, industrial capacity. And so I actually think that we need this mix structure as everybody is talking about. Um, and that if I were a young entrepreneur today, I would be focusing on um, the technologies that are needed, DC appliances, because Africa has a chance to change the whole system if we start to think about what we're seeing out there with innovation. And the, the final thing I would just say to this point is that um, in terms of how do we get it beyond the countries in which it's operating, is nothing breeds success like success. Mm -hmm. to, so to find those presidents and those countries that are, are really willing to work in partnership to build an ecosystem, and I dare say that's why we're focused on a major initiative in East Africa, um, to prove to the world what's possible on-grid and off-grid is the, the more quickly other countries will take this up because this is the moment. This is the moment. That's what Jacqueline is saying. Any more questions from the audience? No questions from the audience. <laughs> okay, well, then let's look at the poll results. We had asked, when do you think Africa will be fully electrified? A very overwhelming positive um, response there. 53% of you say 2040 and beyond. Um, 2020 and 2030 seems a bit unrealistic, but there are also people who say never. What do you think, Cassandra? Does this surprise you, the poll result? That some say never. <laughs> I, I think when they, they're looking at fully electrified and the view is, um, is, is, is probably one way they think it's, it's never. But I guess it's how you're defining being electrified. And I think when we planned the question for the audience, ours was, well, it's both on and off grid. So, um, you know, in your home, in a village, having a solar uh, uh, a delight solution or an M Copa solution or a Mobisol uh, solution, or, and at the same time we're talking about in the city. So um, perhaps the, the question was perhaps misconstrued, but uh, I, I do think there is an opportunity for both on and off grid, 
uh, and a mix of energy solutions, uh, both brown and green, mm -hmm. if I could call it that. Um, and um, uh, and I do think that you know we should we should aim uh, for something better than than never, and definitely not by 2040. I think it should happen sooner. If we really want to see the potential of Africa really being harnessed, we need to we need to make this a, a real sense of urgency. Well, do you agree with the poll results? Do you think 2040 is too soon or too late? No, I think 2040 is, is right. That's where my my perspective was because I think that um, we are going through a moment in history where technological advances really play a big role in, in, in transforming the continent. Um, as, well, as he said, we're already net exporters of energy anyway. So in terms of oil and gas, 10% of global consumption is, is African oil and gas. Okay? If we only, we only consume 3% of, glo of the global energy mix, yet we, we contribute 10% into the export market. So in reality, we, we have more than enough. What's missing is the right policies the right infrastructure for us to trade within ourselves. Okay? We should be piping gas across Africa to countries that require gas. That would be 3% of what we exported, assuming we had the gas infrastructure. But we, we, we flare half, as, uh, half, half the gas that is required to power the continent, mm -hmm. it's burnt into the atmosphere, and all that's required to take it to countries who need it is gas pipelines, oh, which can create employment. So in reality, we've got, the, we've got the resources. What we do need is the planning, we need the mix, we need the advent of technology, and we do need to be able to deploy different solutions for different markets. And I think it's critical we do that because our, our problems or our challenges are not conventional. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's a statement here off of Twitter. There's a great impact if we maximize energy penetration in schools for education. Uh, Jacqueline, do you have anything to say about that? Well, I'm sure, Jasandra, you've been connected to that as well. We've been working with that through companies. Um, uh, again, that are focusing first on home system are moving from the bottom up and are now essentially because the solar panels are modular, they are now going into the schools. I was just talking with B Box um, here in Rwanda and they have um, brought solar electricity to many, many schools. And what's so powerful about that, and it's a way that government and the DFIs can also work, is that then you are, you are creating awareness. The kids then go home to their parents to talk about. The, the applicability of solar in clinics in, um, in schools, which is, again, why I'm such a believer in this movement. Okay, Mwancha, really quickly before we take closing remarks. Well, I just wanted to answer those who said 2040 onwards. If you, ask, if you had asked me 1990 how long it would take to get a phone, because yeah. I'd applied for a phone and waited for years, mm -hmm. I would have said never. Mm -hmm. Now, today, you know what has happened. Mm -hmm. That's the answer. I want to add that we need a moonshot of 15 years should be a possibility if we look at the customers themselves and their capability and their desire to get out of darkness and move away from kerosene and wood into a solar future. And if they could see, if we have the image of every household taking free energy from the sun as an example to the world, we can solve both poverty and energy help avert climate change and that's the real opportunity for this this continent but it really requires that sense of urgency okay well we need to wrap up so i'm going to once again go around and ask you the question we began with how can africa move towards a smart energy system <laughs> some tangible some tangible examples we'll begin with you wally um i think certainly awareness i mean to be honest i learned a lot being here today um, and I think making, making smart energy a priority um, in the national policies um, such that it's, it's something which is, is, is rolled in. Unfortunately, we, there's too much focus on conventional energy sources, and conventional energy sources are very, very expensive um, to deploy, and usually require too much, quite a bit of time. And that sense of energy that's been mentioned repeatedly in our conversation today um, tends to suggest that we're only going to bridge this gap um, and achieve um, uh, an objective potentially in the next 20 years by using very, very aggressive smart energy solutions as part of our overall energy mix. Okay, Jacinda, what are your views? Um, so, President Adesima has definitely inspired me. Uh, I, I have to admit, having hearing him speak about the vision that he has for the African Development Bank in terms of how to actually roll out smart energy infrastructure is, is, is very impressive. I think he has that sense of energy, uh, of urgency. 
uh, I think through, through what he plans to do, I do think that governments will start focusing on a regulatory policy. Um, it is definitely not a, a green only or uh, off-grid world. It is definitely a combination of, of energy mix, big and small projects, uh, and the mm -hmm. medium-sized one as well. Um, and I, I think what is also important is, is to look at what we've done in the past on the African continent. And we've had some transformational projects, Azura being one, um, Lake Tekana being another. Those took 10 to 12 years to actually develop and, and start construction. I think we can learn from that and see how, how, what could we accelerate in terms of, of adoption? How can we actually roll out? Okay, Jacqueline. Um, I, I would say the similar, Ch change the narrative, get the financing right. What, one thing that we didn't talk about is um, really invest in the human system. I think that a distributive system, as with cell phones, actually offers yeah. enormous opportunity to uh, create jobs and increase people's individual income. And that, finally, that the way that we build an energy future, to your point, Jacindra, mm. um, is for all of us to get on board. Uh, the private sector, government, and civil society. Mm -hmm. And finally, Moncha. Smart means uh, clean energy, access, and technology. We are now sitting in exciting times, mm -hmm. so we need innovation, we need investment, we need policies that will encourage all this. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, to our viewers here physically, to our viewers on the webcast, and obviously those who are joining us on TV, but we're concluding by saying in order for us as a continent to achieve this dream, we need awareness, key policy implementation, a sense of urgency also needs to, the sense of urgency needs to grow, getting the financing right and getting everyone on board. Thank you very much and good morning. Thank you.